So our next lab activity will be torsion. Uh, I propose testing a steel rod that's 16 inches long and 3 quarters inch in diameter. Uh, it'll have a modulus of elasticity of uh, 30,000 KSI and Poisson's ratio 0.25. Where in real life uh, will you see an example of a circular cross section? Well, for example, the propeller shaft of a small aircraft, uh, like that small aircraft that you just saw me standing in front of, uh, that was a Beechcraft Bonanza. So a propeller shaft would be one example of a structural member that has a circular cross-section. Here's the center line. Uh, now there are two strain gauges that are glued onto this specimen, two strain gauges glued to the surface. Now, one of the strain gauges looks like this. It's at a 45 degree angle to the longitudinal axis. So this angle right here, 45 degrees. 45 degree angle to the longitudinal axis. The second strain gauge is at a 90 degree angle to this first strain gauge. So it'll look like this. 90 degree angle to the first strain gauge, uh, meaning 45 degree angle with the longitudinal axis. So both strain gauges are at a 45 degree angle to the longitudinal axis, and they're at uh, 90 degree angles to each other. So how does that look? Do you know how a strain gauge works? Well, I have two strain gauges glued to the surface of this torsional member. And now these two strain gauges are in the principal directions. I'm trying to measure the principal stresses. Uh, what do I mean by principal stresses? Principal stresses are the maximum tensile or compressive stresses that uh, a tiny stress element on the surface of this member is subjected to. Uh, you can actually find the principal stresses using Moore's circle. Uh, if you studied Moore's circle in your solid mechanics course, uh, you learned how to find those. So I've got these strain gauges in the principal directions because I'm interested in finding the principal stresses. So imagine the shaft here with a circular cross section. I'm redrawing it. Okay, so imagine this shaft that has a circular cross section. I redrew it for clarity. Uh, picture a small stress element on the surface of this shaft. So here's a stress element. You have to imagine that I'm looking at this under the microscope. So this is exaggerated, of course. I'm going to give it an x-axis and a y-axis. So this is the x-axis, which is along the longitudinal axis of the, uh, the uh, torsional member. And then this will be the y-axis. So an x-axis and a y-axis, and uh, once again, uh, this is a microscopically small stress element on the surface of the shaft with a circular cross-section. So uh, this square element has four sides to it. I'm going to call this side the x-plane or the x-face. So x-plane. We call it the x-plane because it's perpendicular to the x-axis. Similarly, uh, this side of the square that's on top, I'll call that the y-plane because it's perpendicular to the y-axis. This shaft is being uh, subjected to a torsional load. So uh, let me give this a, a torsion like this. So there's a torque being applied to this. Okay, so this stress element is being subjected to a torsional load, no axial load, uh, no other loads besides the torsional load. So consequently, uh, there will be a certain shear stress acting on this microscopically small element. So this arrow right here, that represents the shear stress that's acting on it. So I'll call that tau subscript x subscript y. The first subscript indicates the face on which the shear stress is acting. The second subscript indicates the direction, so it's in the y direction. It's on the x face, that's the first subscript, x, for the face that it's acting on. The second subscript is the direction that it's acting in. Now if you consider the sum of the forces in the y direction, 
Uh, I can't just have this shear stress acting on it, otherwise the square would move down. So to counterbalance that, I need a certain shear stress acting up, equal and opposite. So the magnitude of that arrow will also be tau sub xy. Okay, so is it in equilibrium? What if I want to take the sum of the moments about point O, O is an Oscar, O is in the lower left hand corner of this square. If I want to take the sum of the moments about point O, it's not going to be in equilibrium because this tau sub xy is going to tend to want to make this square rotate. So to balance that out, I need another stress arrow acting on the top like so whose magnitude will be equal to tau sub xy. So these three arrows that you see so far are all magnitude tau sub xy. So now is it in equilibrium? Well in the x direction it's not in equilibrium because I've just got this arrow pointing to the left. So to balance that out, I need another arrow pointing to the right. So there it is. Now it is in equilibrium. What is the magnitude of that tau sub xy anyway? Tau sub xy is equal to torque T times radius R divided by J. J is the polar moment of inertia. So uh, the radius of this thing, here's the radius. I told you at the beginning of the video that this shaft will be 3 fourth inch diameter, meaning that R is 3 eighth inch. So R is equal to 3 eighth inch. A polar moment of inertia, uh, do you remember the formula for that? Pi r to the fourth over two. Uh, in this particular scenario, I don't have any normal stresses. Uh, usually we think of normal stresses as acting perpendicular to the faces of the stress element. So I'd have a normal stress pointing outward here, or maybe inward, a normal stress over here, pointing towards the square or away from the square. I might think of a normal stress acting on the top or on the bottom, but in this particular scenario, I don't have any normal stresses. This is only being subjected to torsion. So uh, let me draw more circle for this scenario. Okay, so I'm going to have the x-axis and the y-axis. The x-axis I'm going to call sigma subnormal. The y-axis I'll call tau. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is plot the points 0 tau and 0 negative tau. So 0 tau, that's up here. 0 tau. Uh, this tau is the tr over j that I told you about a minute ago. Uh, this tau just means the general tau. I know it's kind of confusing because I'm using tau to represent two different things. But uh, uh, the tau that's in black, that represents the y-axis. And the tau that's in blue, that's tr divided by j, the blue tau. So plot 0 tau and then plot 0 negative tau. So what's the radius on this? I'm eyeballing this. So a zero negative tau, I'll say that's about here. Okay, so I plotted two points. Uh, where is the center of Moore's circle in this case? The center of Moore's circle will be the origin, zero, zero, where my finger is. So uh, based on that, the center of the circle and the radius of the circle, which is tau, I can actually draw Moore's circle. So eyeballing this. Okay, so uh, that approximately is what Moore's circle looks like. Hang on a minute. Maybe that's slightly better. So uh, that is approximately what Moore's circle is going to look like. Okay, now uh, what is special about where Moore's circle crosses the x-axis? Uh, it crosses the x-axis at uh, what are known as the principal stresses. So right here. I'll say that the coordinates of that point are sigma sub 1 comma 0 and then over here that'll be sigma sub 2 comma 0. So those are the principal stresses. Where Moore's circle crosses the x-axis are the principal stresses. Uh, this is tensile because it's positive. This is compressive because it's negative. Sigma 2 is actually negative. And so as you can see from Moore's circle, both sigma 1 and sigma 2 are equal in magnitude. They're both equal to the radius of Moore's circle. 
and they are also equal to tau because tau is also the radius of the circle. So the central theme of what I'm trying to get across to you here is that the magnitude of sigma sub 1 is equal to the magnitude of sigma sub 2 which is equal to the shear stress tau. And so once I know what tau is, tr divided by j, then I know what my principal stresses are, the sigma 1 and the sigma 2. So uh, there you have it. What happens if I rotate clockwise in Mohr's circle? If I go from this point down to this point, I'm rotating, uh, what is that, uh, counterclockwise? 90 degrees. Uh, rotating 90 degrees on Mohr's circle means rotating 45 degrees in real life. Uh, an angle in Mohr's circle represents double what it is in real life. So if I'm at this location, what that represents is the stress element that I had up here a moment ago. Remember this stress element? And I had the four arrows acting on it? The four stress arrows? Remember this from a little while ago? What if I rotate that 45 degrees? Can you see this? If I rotate this 45 degrees, it would look like this. You see that? So I rotated. I rotated this original stress element 45 degrees. So uh, erase part of this. I rotated it through an angle of 45 degrees. Rotate this 45 degrees and you get this. So this orientation would be like standing on this point, being at this location in a Morris circle. If I rotate this stress element 45 degrees, it's like rotating 90 degrees on Morris circle. So where does that put me? Whether I rotate in this direction or this direction, it puts me at the principal stresses, doesn't it? So at the principal stresses, I'd actually have a scenario like this. I'd have a sigma 1, which is in tension, so sigma 1 like that, and sigma 1 like this. And you see those sigma 1s? Okay, I moved you back a little bit so you can see it. So I have the sigma 1s that are in tension, and I have the sigma 2s that are in compression. So, sorry, I have to erase part of Moore's circle. So I've got the sigma 2 like this, and the sigma 2 like this. That's in compression. So what happens is, I start off with this stress element that I had up here a little earlier. I rotate it 45 degrees and I got this stress element. Uh, what happened to the shear stresses that were acting on the sides? Uh, those shrink down to zero because if I'm at either of these locations, take a look at the y coordinate. That's zero, meaning that the shear stresses shrink down to zero. So here's where that 45 degree angle comes from. That's what's special about 45 degrees. So uh, when I do this experiment uh, very shortly here, what I'm measuring are the principal stresses, the sigma 1 and the sigma 2. The shear stresses go down to zero in this orientation. Okay, so now you can see everything. Uh, the strain indicator is over here. Uh, torsion testing machine here. Specimen over here. So uh, let me get this thing started. So uh, first let me document uh, when this is. Okay, so uh, what time is it? Saturday, January 23rd, 4.09 p.m. Saturday, January 23rd, 4.09 in the afternoon. Here's the loading gauge. The controls, this is the loading dial right here. The stop button, the load button, the unload button. Now over here is the specimen. And there are two strain gauges glued on there. Kind of hard to see, but there are two strain gauges. Electric motor over here. Take a look at the specs on this. So the specimen is already loaded. I'll tighten it in just a moment. The wires that are coming out of the strain gauge. Okay, there, I plugged them in. I'll be using the two arm Wheatstone bridge. The switch is pointing to two arm. 
uh, the wrenches that we use to tighten the specimen are in here. If I open the hood, I've got some wrenches in there. The on lever is over here on the left. So if I turn this on, it lights up. So there's some lights that uh, come on uh, behind the loading gauge. So how do you interpret this? Okay, so this is the dummy needle, this needle that I'm turning here. Uh, zero pounds, zero pounds, 50 pounds, 100 pounds. At least that's the way that it's configured now. Uh, what I have here is a range selector. See this right here, range selector? So right now I'm on setting four. So if I change this to setting three, for example, uh, you see the numbers change. So uh, 125, 250, 375. So it looks as though the capacity is 2,500 pound inches. If I change this to setting number two, what is the capacity now? 5,000, and this window says uh, 250, this is 500. Okay, let me change this to setting number one. So now the capacity is 10,000. So with the 12 o'clock position, that's both zero and 10,000. And now the first window is 500. So uh, what setting did I start with? I think it was on four. What does five tell me? Setting number five, the capacity is 500 pound inches. So for today's activity, I will be using number four. All right, so uh, the first thing I do is turn it on. That's the lever over here on the left. I did that a moment ago. I turned it on. And then it says turn on the BLH strain indicator. So turning that on like so. Uh, let me make sure that the specimen is in there nice and tight. So using these wrenches, I'm gonna make sure it's in here nice and tight. If you can see this from where you're sitting but uh, when I manually apply a torque to this uh, the load needle actually moves so that's uh, that's not the electric motor doing it but that's me doing it see the needle moving there on the loading gauge all right so I'm confident that it's in there tight so let me put these back okay so where was I I turn on the BLH strain indicator, so I just did that. Okay, so the next thing that I'm going to do is center the needle on the strain indicator box. Center the needle using the strain measurement wheel. And uh, from where you're sitting, you can't see it, but I'll read the numbers to you. So I just centered the needle using the strain measurement wheel on the side, and I am reading 3745. 3745. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is bring the loading up to 250. So that's right here, the 3 o'clock position. Okay, so here is the loading gauge. Uh, right now I'm at zero pounds. That's the 12 o'clock position. Also the 1,000 pound position. Right now it's zero. So a 250, that's right here, that's the three o'clock position, about there. So to bring this needle, the loading needle, to the three o'clock position, I turn the loading dial. Uh, right now I've got stop, a little light above the stop button is on. So I actually have to press load before I turn the loading dial. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna press load, and then I'm gonna turn the loading dial. You hear that? Okay, so I'm going to turn the loading dial until I get this needle to be in the 3 o'clock position. That will be 250 pound inches. Once I get to that position, then I'm going to take a reading from the strain indicator box. Okay. All right, so turning the loading dial. Yeah. 
There it goes. Slow it down. Oops, I overshot. I went a little bit beyond 250. I went a little bit beyond 250, so let me show you up close. What I was saying is that I went a little bit beyond 250. You see this? I wanted to stop here, but I went a little bit too far. So if that happened, I just press stop and then unload and then turn the loading dial in the same uh, direction. Uh, and that, in this case, that's clockwise. So watch what happens when I do that. See, it goes back down. Ah, I want it to stop at 250. Okay, so I press stop and then load. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn the loading dial until I get to 250. Okay, how's that? Got it? Okay. All right, so now that I am at 250, I'm gonna take a strain indicator reading. Okay. Uh, four zero five zero. Four zero five zero. Okay. It's warm in here. Uh, I'm wearing a coat today because it was raining outside earlier. It's one of those rare, uh, cold, rainy days in San Diego. Okay, so we got a reading at uh, 250. Uh, next stop, 500. So 500, that is the 6 o'clock position down here. So how do I get it to 500 pound inches? Okay, roll up my sleeves and get to work. Okay, I'm gonna turn the loading dial. I don't know if you can see it from where you're sitting over there. Oh, went a little bit too far. So stop and then unload. There it is, 500. So let me press stop and then load. So now I'm going to take another reading over here. I'll make it 4300. Zero, zero. Okay, next stop, 750. So 750, that is the 9 o'clock position. Okay, so turn the loading dial. Right there. Okay. 750. So I'm going to take a strain reading. Forty-five fifty four five five zero. And then lastly, 1,000 pounds. So 1,000 pounds, that's the 12 o'clock position. So uh, let me get a close-up of this. Now I'm at 750. I'm going to get it up to 1,000. So I'm going to turn the loading dial right here. So as I turn that, watch the needle rise. get moving there okay that's about 850 uh, there's nothing noticeable happening to the specimen see the specimen here even though I've got about uh, 850 pound inches on it uh, the deformation isn't enough for uh, it is not enough for us to be able to tell by looking at it with a naked eye. So there is some deformation, but uh, I certainly can't tell. Okay, let me continue adding load to this. Almost there. Right there. A thousand. You good with that? Okay, so now I'm going to take a reading at a thousand. It's slipping a little bit. Let me bring this back up. 
A thousand, okay. So a strain rating. Uh, call it uh, 4820. 4820. Okay, now I'm going to take strain readings on the way back down. So stop, unload, back to 750. So I brought the loading back down to 750 pound inches. Uh, maybe I can get this a little closer, hang on. About there. Okay. Oops. Okay, so right here, that needle in the middle, and what does this say? 4540? 4540 at 750 pound inches on the unloading side. Okay, next stop. 500 pound inches. That's down here at the six o'clock position. So 500 pound inches. Unload. The unload button is uh, currently operational. So when I turn the loading dial, watch what happens to the load needle. About there. About there. Let me come over here and take a strain reading. So I turn the strain measurement wheel. What does that say in the window? Uh, let's call it uh, 4285. I want to take it down to uh, 250 pound inches. 250. Let me step back so you can see everything. Specimen over here. No noticeable change, of course. All right, so I turn the load and dial. Right there. Oh, went too far. Oops. Stop. Load. Right there. Okay, so I hope it stays. Take a strain reading. 4050. 4050. Okay, lastly, I'm going to get back to zero. That's up here. Zero. So uh, press stop, press unload, turn the loading dial, and uh, let me bring this back down to zero. I step back away from the loading dial because once it gets to zero, uh, it's not going to go beyond that. Move this needle out of the way. Okay, I'll turn this a little bit farther. How close can I get to zero? I really can't get exactly to zero. That's always an issue with this machine. So I have a little bit of loading on there. Okay, I give up. So it's about five, so five pound inches. What is the strain reading for five pound inches? Thirty-seven forty-five. Thirty-seven forty-five. I'm done. I'm back down to zero. I think zero. So now that I'm done, I can press stop. I'm going to turn it off. Turn it off over here, like so. The lights go off. Turn off the strain indicator, like so.